So, where was I? Oh, yeah. Welcome to The Note Show. Deep diving into the lives and minds of guests across the whole spectrum of the arts. Exploring the big why behind what makes them tick and having a few laughs along the way. <laughs> now here's your host, Joshua Note. Hey folks, how's it going? It is episode one of The Note Show. And I have said that before. <laughs> it's actually like episode 51 or something uh, we're not entirely sure what episode this would be but um, we've been gone for five years so if anyone doesn't know we are an arts podcast that started in October 2013 and ran for a couple of years and like I said we did about 50 plus episodes with people across the whole spectrum of the arts bi-weekly and uh, we had a really good time doing it I especially felt very lucky and fortunate to interview so many people and introduce the audience that we grew to all these different personalities and and artistic people doing cool projects and we got to see and share some wonderful stuff so we're back now five years after we stopped doing the show and a slightly new type of format but uh, it's really exciting to be back and I feel like it's a new adventure we're starting a new thing we were going to call it season two and then we decided you know what no let's actually delete our old episodes and uh, have a brand new start so we have a new team they are lily barkorda researcher and producer aaron dowd producer who used to be the podcast editor paroma chakrabarti is our editor my assistant is dina o'brien and artwork is done by larray graphics so we are doing the show now from West Yorkshire, United Kingdom, where we used to do it from, except the brief period where I went to America and interviewed some people there. And we've got some wonderful guests appearing, and we hope you really enjoy them. I want to say thank you so much to them. I want to say a special thank you to people from other podcasts who've encouraged us to come back and me to get back hosting. And, and it's really exciting that people have been so nice on social and shared us and liked us and followed us. Please do follow at the Note Show pod on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Instagram, whichever one you use most or all three just for the sake of it at the note show pod is us and we really appreciate you helping out and uh, giving us a listen once a week it's a dark time and if we can provide you know 20 to 35 45 minutes of entertainment once a week every Wednesday then we've done something good and it's our little tiny tiny contribution to the world at the moment because it's the best we can do but we hope you'll take it our guest this week is Mark Brennan. He is someone who appeared on the show in the past. I got in touch with him and said, we're restarting. Would you give us a chance? And he said, yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate that, Mark. Thank you for coming on. You were really informative. And uh, he's a badass filmmaker, wonderful guy. And uh, I say in the interview that I've seen one of his shows in real life, one of his films. And I mean that because now he's, because of lockdown, having to run Facebook premieres in private groups which he'll talk about and the feedback I can tell you because I was in those groups is just wonderful everyone loved Squall his new film just the way that they loved T for Two his last film so without further ado let's rock and roll and get on with the show I'm here with Mark Brennan, an old friend of mine he's a filmmaker he has produced some amazing work and I have seen in real life one of his films a premiere and I really, really enjoyed it. It was amazing. Tea for two. And we talked about half a decade ago, I think, Mark. We did. We did. And thank you for having me back today. I did have a thought this morning, actually, is that you mentioned, I've seen mentioned that it's the, it's the, the long return of the no show today. And I realized that the last time we spoke was also the last time I actually made a film. So it's quite timely that you're back. And now I'm back with something new to talk about as well. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, it's New Horizons. Exactly. No affiliation with Animal Crossing. <laughs> None. Although I am playing it quite a lot. Um, I was going to ask before we <laughs> before we kick into the real questions, what are you reading, listening to or playing when it comes to lockdown? Oh, when it comes to lockdown. Okay, so I've, I've been playing a lot of Star Wars Battlefront 2 with some friends online. Uh, I'm not a huge gamer, but who doesn't like shooting stormtroopers now and again? Um, it was it, it, That's a lot of fun. Mostly watching things. I just finished the latest series of Ozark, which I think is, is fantastic. I was especially impressed with. They introduced a new character into this last series, played by an actor called Tom Pelfrey, and... Um, I've not seen him in anything before, and he's outstanding. I mean, he's definitely a guy I'm going to be keeping an eye out for in the future. I thought he was great. 
Oh, well, well, I've never even seen Ozark. That sounds like something I need to add to my watch list. Oh, it's very good. It, it can be quite tense. Well, it, we've all got a lot of tension going on at the moment. <laughs> yeah, sure there's never too much in my, in my mind. It's like when things are like this, go, right, how can I ramp things up, really? What can I put on the telly just to make it even more uh, to the point <laughs> where I might explode? Yeah, well, I've not I've not turned to watching the film Contagion yet, although my brother has, has told me several times that I should. <laughs> I haven't watched that. I did watch 28 Days Later, though, I have to admit. And um, I haven't watched it in a long time. But I do know now there is one scene in there that we've evidently proved would never happen, and that is... Um, bunch of characters find a, a fully stocked supermarket in the middle yeah. of a zombie apocalypse which <laughs> we now know is a complete impossibility so that was the one thing maybe danny boyle didn't get quite right on that this film this is not the apocalypse that we were <laughs> advertised <laughs> exactly right. yeah absolutely yeah i i saw christopher eccleston last year he's in that isn't he he's the um he is uh, yes yeah quite a scary character in it as well Saw him doing Shakespeare last year, and he was wonderful. And uh, yeah, no, that's awesome. I'm really glad to hear that you're sort of keeping sane, and uh, you know, doing stuff because I think working hard on on projects is, and and getting stuff done, which I know you're you do, and we're about to talk about something, is the only way around this. I think it's it's really positive. And you have a, a short film which I have seen. I got a sneak peek, and can we talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, of course. It's called Squall. It's a short drama about two complete strangers at rock bottom in their lives for, for very different reasons who meet one night in a hotel bar under unusual circumstances and go on to have quite a random evening together where they kind of put their respective broken worlds to rights. It's wonderful. I really enjoyed it. I connected with the characters. I thought the actors were brilliant. The film is uh, just a brilliant work of art. I, mean, I don't want to throw too many compliments at you, but... <laughs> but uh, <laughs> oh, please do. No, that's fine. <laughs> but I can say, and you know this is a fact, that my mum really liked it. <laughs> you said that was really sweet. It's really nice that your mum enjoyed it as much as she did. No, she, she was, thought it was wonderful, and she was really excited that I was having you back on the show, actually. So it's it's pretty good. And uh, she just made herself scarce. I'm spending my eyes at my mum's house. Uh, I'm not spending it at my parents, but I am currently in their caravan on their driveway, which is now my office away from home. So when I need to find somewhere quiet to go and do some work or, or chat to someone like yourself, I'm in a caravan with a kettle and a pot of coffee and I'm sorted. I'm quite Nothing lucky. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that <laughs> at all. That's very handy. So let's get into these questions. Here's a big, broad one for you, Mark, and I'm sure you're going to hit it out of the park. You're a writer, producer, and director. Tell us a bit about your creative process for each of these disciplines, and do you have different approaches for each? Oh, we're starting with the big ones. Okay. Yeah. Yes, very different approaches for each. The writing in particular, um, if it's something... I'm going to have to produce and pull together. I'll probably be very mindful of that while writing it because when making any kind of short independent project, budgets are not always the biggest. So you want to make life as easy for yourself if you can. So I will keep that in mind when writing something. Now, will I have access to that certain location? Do I know someone who will help me out with that special effect, you know, that kind of thing. Even actors as well, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that will always make a, a real difference uh, to, to the writing when I know I'm going to have to put it together. If I'm not having to put it together, which is something I'm doing at the moment, I've co-written a short with a comedian called Paul F. Taylor that was called I Want to Make You Happy. Oh. And it was for a director called Ben Malaby, who's a BAFTA nominated comedy director. And we made a, a short film that we're now writing into a, a, a pitch for a TV show. This is really exciting. I'm really excited about it. It's a really exciting project. I'm, I'm really glad to be involved with it. But the good thing about it is, is that um, I'm only the writer, so um, I don't need to concern myself with, I'll just write something and go, well, they, they can find that out. That's their problem. They will have to go and find <laughs> yeah. this like escaped army of rabid giraffes, you know, or something like that. There aren't giraffes. That's just a joke. But no, no, um, no, I was going to say what? <laughs> but that's, so that's nice. That can be quite freeing and quite liberating and make me think outside the box a little more when I don't have to sort of think too much about the finished product, I suppose. Yeah, and I understand that totally. I remember once you shared with me a short script, actually, that I read a long time ago, and I thought it was really good about death, if that's right. Did you remember? Oh, yeah, uh, death, Death's Door. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that's another one I'd also like to revisit. We, we, I was working on that to develop it into a feature film with a filmmaker called Andrew Harmer, which you've reminded me. I need to go back to him actually and say, what should we do with this, Andrew? That's what I'm here for. <laughs> yes, no, exactly. So, um, yeah, that was uh, another one that was a bit of a, a bleak bleak dark comedy uh, obviously being about death <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, yeah that's another one I'll, I'll have to revisit I've got a few sort of projects 
on at the moment. And writing wise, you know, this is on the surface of it, an ideal time to get stuck in because we're all stuck at home and, you know, mm-hmm. everyone has nothing but time at the moment. I have found it a little distracting to get back into it with, with everything that is going on. I think there's probably a lot of creative people out there that are feeling this pressure to come out the other side of this with some finished masterpiece because they have no excuse they've been at home but I don't really kind of hold to that I can understand why people would put that pressure on themselves but I think what's important is coming out the other side of this just healthy and well and, and if yeah. you come out of this with things unfinished that's fine so I'm, I'm writing when great. I'm able to and when I'm not I'm not beating myself up about it well good for you I saw you posted on Twitter literally that if you if you come out of this and you haven't finished your novel slash whatever slash masterpiece that's just fine because there are things circulating on Twitter about you lack discipline if you come out of isolation not having finished a I think project. I saw that exact tweet from somebody, yeah, and uh, I wholly disagree. It's quite a mean, it's quite a mean <laughs> tweet, really. Yeah, it's, it's obviously someone who thinks an awful lot of themselves and uh, maybe not quite taken in what's going on in the world right now. But um, I think creators can be the quickest people to beat themselves up at the best of times and yeah. tell themselves off for procrastinating and then not finishing things and this is a strange time for people that work on projects on their own at home to have all this time. So, you know, like I said, on the surface, it sounds like a great thing, but I think it can also put a tremendous amount of pressure on some people to feel like they're not doing enough when I don't think this is really a time where people need to concern themselves too much with that. It's more about being safe and being well. And if you, and if you can put something together, awesome. Good for you. That's great. But like I said, equally, if you don't, that's fine too, you know, just yeah. get through this and um, work on it the other side. I think that's a really, really good message. And and especially even if it goes on for a long time, the pressure that goes on with people going through this, the anxiety it's causing and the just sheer worry is a big obstacle. And I know that someone's coming on this show in a few weeks and one of my one of my sort of literary heroes is coming on and she told me that she and all the writers that she knows are actually having writer's block. And, uh, mm. and and she's someone I look up to and has guided my own children's book writing. And I find it amazing that she said that. And I said, well, that's really good because you know what? I'm I'm stuck actually on my book and uh, I suddenly don't feel bad. So I think spreading that message is probably a really nice thing to do. So yeah, kind of thank you, Mark. You know, I think oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to be as sage-like as I can for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're, actually, you're hitting it. You're hitting it. Sage <laughs> Doing my best. <laughs> so this is another big one. Okay. And uh, feel free to take a run up to it. <laughs> okay, okay. If, if you could only be one of writer, director, or producer, which one would you choose and why? Oh, that's a good one. If I could only be one. I can tell you now the one wouldn't be producing <laughs> because wow. uh, that's, that's something that's kind of come out of necessity and kind of what I do for a living with commercial and brand content and corporate content. I, I do that because uh, I, I'm just able to, and it was my job full time for a long time. So it would have to come down between writing or directing. And writing I think and directing. right before Squall, I probably would have said writing because Oh, it's this has been my first love for a long time. I love writing and I, I'm even happy writing for other people. I just love writing. But I had such an incredible experience finally getting to make Squall and being on set with such an amazing team and incredible actors that I don't think I could ever go without that again. So I would have to say probably now, if I had to pick one, it would be directing. Director. Director mm. Mark Brennan. Right. Well, luckily, we live in a world where you can be all three. <laughs> currently, currently, we currently, do. Yeah. Currently, <laughs> yeah. we do. Yeah. Well, let's just see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, oh, we laugh, but it's dark. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Gallows humor all the way. Yeah, absolutely. 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 So we're going to get into what I wanted to talk about most of all after Squall. I understand you're the director and co-founder of the X6 Festival, like we mentioned. And uh, tell us a bit about the festival. And one thing I really want is your motivation in starting it. Because I know that it's, you said to me the other day that it took away from the chance that you had to make another film. And obviously, as we mentioned at the beginning, the last time we talked, it was your previous film, T for Two, which I absolutely loved. I was just watching a clip from it this morning. And it's amazing to me that, you know, it's been, what, five, six years? Yeah, it will have been, uh, it was shot, I think, November 2014 14. and then finished in early 2015. So it has been five years. And it was, in fact, taking that film on the festival circuit, which led to Exit 6 kind of coming together. So um, I got to take the film to 
some really nice film festivals, especially one up in York called um, Aesthetica, which is one of the best short film festivals in the country for sure. Yeah. What struck me when myself and my colleague Carl arrived in the city was how the whole city was a buzz with this event that was happening you know all the the eateries had discounts for for film delegates and it, it wasn't just you wow. know watching films and having having a few panel discussions everyone seemed to be swept up in it all the bars all the restaurants like the whole place was a, was a buzz and it just got us realizing where we're based which is in basingstoke in north hampshire if we wanted to go to any event like that we had to travel far and wide to get to it and nothing like it was being right. done where we lived. So having had that experience and wanting to bring it home, we all had the idea, well, we've been to enough of these things to know that if we were going to run one, how would we do it? And knowing the venues we have available to us here, again, how would we do it? And it kind of uh, spawned from there. And um, it's gone from strength to strength since. This is our fifth year now that we're, we're running. We're in um, Film Freeway's Top 100 Best reviewed film Number festival four, world, world, I believe. worldwide. Uh, is it really? I haven't checked. I know we're on the top 100, but I don't know where exactly. Oh, maybe don't um, quote me on that. I'm pretty sure that's what I just read. <laughs> let's, let's let everybody believe that. That's good. Yes, okay. definitely. Uh, and that's out of 8,000 events worldwide that they wow, facilitate. Wait. So to be, for us, our little, our little festival in Basingstoke, to be in the top 100 out of 8,000 around the world, uh, we're all incredibly proud of and grateful for the feedback we've had from the filmmakers that have have visited us well i think i would really like to come actually this year if i, if I can hopefully it will be on we're not till september 26th 26, so hopefully yeah. there's a chance that the world will be back on its feet uh, to a degree by then so hopefully it all will still be going ahead and please do come down for it oh i would love to it'd be amazing and probably do another interview about it at the time if, we, if it's on that'd be great yeah, absolutely. So on the question, I've got a, this is from Lily, one of our producers, and uh, and she was reading an interview of yours, and it's how you summed up Basingstoke. So I have to ask you this question, and it's a little bit easier. Is Basingstoke really amazing Stoke? It absolutely <laughs> is amazing Stoke. I think that's technically the correct pronunciation. If you ever see it written anywhere, uh, you should be saying in your head, amazing Stoke every time. Amazing Stoke. Yeah. <laughs> it is yeah i've never been i can't wait to come and exit six is obviously that's it really gets its name that's what we're saying so it, it is yeah the actual origins the of the name were basingstoke has a bit of a not the best reputation about it it's a it's the butt of a lot of jokes and um i think they even take the mick out of it in the young ones and eastenders and, and programs like that and and it, it, yeah it doesn't have the best reputation it can be seen as a bit boring and bland so being realistic when putting the festival together, we knew we couldn't call it the Basingstoke Film Festival because even I wouldn't go to that. So we had to call it something different. We are Junction 6 on the mm -hmm. M3. That's where we are. So we were thinking about Junction 6 and calling it that. And then Carl, again, I mentioned you came to the film festival with me. I remember distinctly saying, I've just read somewhere that um, in marketing terms, it's really good if you can get an X in a word because it makes people think of sex and everyone likes that. So we should call it <laughs> we should call it exit six instead of junction six. What do you think? And I was just like, sold. Yeah. Let's call it that. So that's where it came from. That's why it is what it is. I definitely heard X is six and just thought of sex, but that is because I think of sex quite we a lot. We all do. We all do. It's totally natural. <laughs> At least we're honest about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're only human. Yes. So on a good day. <laughs> Speaking of Carl, is Carl Austin we're talking about here, right? We are indeed. Yes. We are indeed. So let's get to question five, Mark, for you. What's it like running your own production company, Pork Chop Pictures, and working with Carl Austin? It's been great. I mean, Pork Chop is what, sadly one of the, the outfits that had to take a bit of a backseat while we were putting so much of our energy and attention into Me the too. festival, yeah. and which is why it's taken so long for us to, to make another film being Squall. There were a few other projects we tried to get off the ground in the meantime, but weren't able to. But this is the, the, the one that we've finally been able to get up and running and, and completed, which we're very excited about. It's great working with Kai. He's one of my, my best friends anyway. So who doesn't oh, like really? working with their best friend? Yeah, it's, No, absolutely. Um, I work with one of mine. I'm, I'm interviewing him later tonight, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, there you go. You, you, will, you will know what I mean. No, it's been great that we can keep making these projects together. In fact, it was when we had a few scripts knocking around and deciding which one to do next. It was also Carl that was saying, I think we should do the school one. That's that's the one I think it should be. I think it was at a time when I was looking at something called Twelfth Man, which was much more ambitious. It was a period piece with football and a theatre 
troupe of Shakespearean actors and it was a huge, huge wow. project. And Squall is absolutely not that. So that was one of the ones we weren't able to get off the ground, but then came back to Squall and I'm um, so glad for it. it I'm, I'm so happy with it. To divert a little bit, um, Gary Beadle and Jessica Chamberlain, the two actors who perform in Wonderful. it, are yeah. outstanding and so lucky to, to have had them because to write characters that actors and not just actors, brilliant actors will then, you know, take to heart and take very seriously and, and, and elevate off the page entirely is a beautiful thing to watch. I'm so very grateful to, to the pair of them that they were willing to spend three very long days and nights in Basin Stoke took. in the middle of the summer to get the film made. Oh, well, they did a great job. I thought both of them were fantastic. I was really moved by it. A running theme throughout your work seems to be finding humor in the unexpected, such as in T for Two. What is it about this topic that fascinates you? I think in the particular case of short stories, I do like being parachuted into a situation that the audience has to kind of try and make sense of until they get what's happening. And because of them being not entirely certain from the off what to expect or what is happening, I think you can play around a little more and you can find the humor a little more because a lot of humor comes from your first impression of something and you can be presented with an odd scenario or an odd situation and react to it. Usually, I think normally we tend to react with humor to, to things we don't quite understand or think right. is daft or especially if you got like in the case of TV2 with a dotty old couple acting strangely, like that would be funny. It doesn't matter that there's actually something a little more serious behind it that, that comes to the front later on. Yeah, something really important. That's the secret of the film, isn't it? Yeah, all you have is that first impression. And if that first impression is something a bit balmy or unusual, I find enjoyment in that. Like, I love that. Even in real life, I love that. Like, I, I'm the most open to any bizarre situation there ever is, probably sometimes to my detriment, where usually you should probably just keep your head down and keep walking. But I just find everything so interesting that I can't do that. But particularly with shorts, like I said, with a longer form story, I don't know how... I've yet to try and keep up that same thing in feature format because I haven't tried it in any of the feature scripts I've written. It only tends to be the short stuff where it's an unusual set of circumstances between people that don't know each other. Right. Yeah, it seems mm. to be, a, yeah, definitely a thing for you. And I think it's wonderful. I think I just bring up T for two. Can you do a little uh, description of that for people who haven't seen it yet? Oh, yes. Of course, it's been a while. Uh, yes, T for two. So that <laughs> is about Jim and Alice are working in an idyllic little tea shop in the English countryside who are visited one day by a couple of customers who come in for their lunch. Jim and Alice are a little kooky and unusual. And the customers right. kind of find out as time goes on that everything going on in this tea shop isn't quite what it seems. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. I remember watching that at the premiere and uh, and sitting there in absolute wonder as to what the heck was going on. <laughs> yeah, I loved it when I found out. I remember, I remember choking up seriously. And I won't spoil it. I won't say anything else. Anything else I say would give it away. So uh, we'll put links to that. Yeah, that one's absolutely still online to, to watch freely and available. So if anyone would like to, please do. Oh, that's great. Well, I'll be tweeting on social and uh, and we'll be putting stuff out so that everyone should definitely check that out. It's a really moving film. It's wonderful. And it's really short. Well, it's a short. <laughs> um, it is short. I, I've, I've learned now I should have made it. I probably should have made it shorter. That's one of the things that... Um, I've learned a lot actually from watching a lot of short films through the festival as well. And it was some thinking that went into school too was, you know, if you can make it shorter, make it shorter. So Is that uh, a rule of thumb? I would I would say it's a fair rule for anybody making short films because I think you have such a short amount of time to tell a story that any time spent on something that isn't either moving the, the story forward or the characters forward, or it, it can very quickly feel like it's dragging. Right. And so like, for example, the school was an 11 page script that when the rough cut was put together, as it was scripted, came out 17 and a half minutes long, which is ridiculous and far too long. <laughs> so we had to go through. <laughs> well, it defies the laws of your own uh, Exit 6 festival. Exactly, which is why we only have 15 minutes 15 or less. Minutes or less um, yeah. I mean, that's that's in part a logistical consideration because we're only a one day festival. So there's only so many films films we can we can screen but it's also i think a good maximum length to aim for that helps you with festivals everywhere anyway because it makes you slightly easier to program if you're not 20 to 30 minutes long right so yes yeah, score was 17 and a half minutes when it came out in the rough cut which was obviously hideously too long so we had to go through it with a butcher's knife and got it down to without the credits 12 and a half so lost five minutes of content from it wow. so there were whole scenes gone there were 
sequences chopped and changed and moved about and the film is all the better for it like it's a much better film at 12 and a half minutes than the 17 and a half so the, the rule is always if you can get rid of it you should get rid of it i think anyway with short films well that's awesome i'm actually going to get onto a question about your advice to people in a, in a minute and uh, i think that that's a really good rule of thumb so everybody you know if you can make it shorter make it shorter and get into the exit six film festival in less than 15 minutes <laughs> exactly right so of all the projects we've just talked about t for two and you've worked on you know a lot of things is is tifa 2 in particular one that stands out or are there any others that really stand out in your mind that you want to talk about as far as standing out goes i think both tifa 2 and school will be the ones that do purely because i was both the writer and the the director director. on them tifa 2 will always stand out because it was my first big project i'd ever worked on like before tifa 2 i think we made a film called Soul Matrix that cost about forty pounds to make. It was made <laughs> in a weekend, and it was shot on a DSLR, and that was one of the, the most well-made films that I'd made up to that point. And then T for Two came along, and that ended up being, I think, best part of eighteen, seventeen, eighteen thousand pound budget with right? a full production crew, with the director of photography and first assistant director, and makeup and sound and the whole bells and whistles so i was kind of learning how all of that worked while trying to make the film which was nerve-wracking as anything <laughs> I bet. not only that it was also having actors like uh, john chalice and amanda barry who are like british television icons to work with as well so i've, I've gone from 40 quid and some sandwiches with carl to <laughs> <laughs> tens of thousands of pounds British TV stars, full production crew, and figuring out how it all worked as I was doing it. Wow. And I have to shout out to April Kelly and Sarah Huxley, who were the producers on that. Who Many productions. From many productions, yeah, who produced the film. And um, we were kind of a, a, in the trenches together from, from start to finish. I would not have got through it without them. And they're both some of my best friends to, to this day. We still talk very, very – actually – I was going to say very regularly, I mean daily. <laughs> like every, every day. I talk to you once in every five years. <laughs> exactly, yeah, but it's, it's, it's quality, not quantity. That, that, that's, that's, that's all that right. matters. That's right, that's <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, so that film for sure, and I'll never forget, I will never forget, I didn't know how to wrap a film. Really? Well, I'd never done it before. <laughs> like I said, I'd never had a crew to wrap. <laughs> I had Carl. <laughs> I, it, so, to ha- I, I remember we got to the last day of shooting and the last scene we were filming and um everyone was clapping because the we just wrapped i think the last person sh- we shot with was oh i thought it was, it was it was either abigail or amanda and um while everyone was clapping josh who was the first assistant director and also was on school and can't be without him ever again kind of quietly said to me uh the director is the one that wraps the film and i'm clapping <laughs> and i'm going what, what does that mean <laughs> what do you mean what have i got to do you, know, you just you just say ladies and gentlemen that, that's a wrap for tv too and i go i just say that and he's like yeah I'm I'm like, okay. words. so i shouted it and oh my god it was like midnight on new year's eve everyone was jumping up and down and hugging and clapping <laughs> and it, it was the one of the most euphoric moments i will never forget because i couldn't believe that was the point where i could say i've actually just made and it was a short but i just made my first like proper Oh, properly produced, properly made film. Yeah, I did go for a little quiet walk outside for a second to, to take myself away. And <laughs> I think you deserve that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was uh, that for that. I'll never forget that. So um, yeah, that's definitely a standout for me. And then that's what made school so enjoyable because, as I said, on T for Two, I was learning while I was doing it. Right. And five years later, I'm so much more experienced. As, as a filmmaker that squall, I could really mainly focus on telling the story I wanted to tell and not working out the mechanics and etiquette of a film set and how it all worked. What, you know, the wheels run? Think, exactly, yeah. So I was able to do a lot more, I feel, with squall, and I would like to think it shows and it's a more accomplished piece of work. Well, I think... From a you know personal perspective, I think both of them are wonderful. I couldn't pick between them, but I can see a maturity in Squall and the fact that you're taking a certain very, very personal thing. Well, actually very personal things because there's a lot going on. And it's amazing that you can make a story out of, you know, essentially some really, really human moments, but not huge, big, high concept things. It's mm. wonderful that you've done that. And I think it's just awesome. It's, it's definitely a very grown-up film. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you for saying so. And so on that topic that we were just talking about, to bring it back, you learn to wrap a film. You haven't done that before. You think that shorter is better. 
And now you're the expert on this. You run a film festival. You've got a couple of great short films under your belt. So what advice would you give to people trying to break into the industry? And, and what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Best advice for breaking into the industry? If you mean by best advice I could offer someone making their first short film. Yeah. My first advice would be to make life as easy for yourself as you can. And by that, I mean, when you're writing and putting the film together, make sure you're going to tell a story you have the means to tell. There's no point when you have no money to write the next Star Wars and you have to turn your parents' bedroom into a flight deck or something like that. Like It's not, <laughs> it's not going to work. So um, I would look around you, see what you have access to, see, see what's there that you can use and make part of an integral story. And to some degree... Maybe even reverse engineer it slightly. So, you know, I know I have these things at my disposal. What story can I tell with these things? Right. Because that's that will make your life easier than coming up with a story first and then with no money and no no resources to then go, right, how do I create that? That that can help you out an awful lot. Because I've seen a lot of short films where I can't applaud ambition enough. Ambition is great, but uh, ambition that falls short of practicality, I suppose. It really does show in in, in a short film if, if, you've, if you've overstretched yourself slightly. So I, again, just be be kinder to yourself, make life easier on yourself and tell the story that you can with what you have. Wow. Yeah, no, I think that's really, really important. And and just to bring it back, do you remember the best piece of advice that you've ever received? I, I do, but I can't remember where I got it from, um, oh. which is really, and I can't remember if someone told me it or if I've read it, but it's something that I tell to other people because it's absolutely true and I live by it and it's the best bit of advice I've ever had to do with filmmaking. And that is whenever you make a film, you make three films and you need to keep that in mind through the whole of the project. And what that means is, is the film you write will be different to the film you shoot, will be different to the film that you edit. Wow. And you always have to be mindful of that because it's great being prepared and have the project developed and the script ready and you've rehearsed everything. And But the day you get on set, there will be something that changes. Something might go wrong. You might make a different creative choice that you weren't thinking of during the writing element. So the way you shot it changes. And then when you're in the edit and the script and the editor has the script and, and can see, hang on, this is this is not how it was written. You've, you've changed something here. But then also... For some reason, it can be the energy of the performances or a, or a continuity issue or a, a narrative issue that some scenes that were written to go side by side, for some reason, will not cut together correctly in the edit. So you have to start thinking outside the box. So the film that you end up with will be different for the film you started out to make. And I think some filmmakers can panic if they're too locked on or precious about the script and rigid. Yeah, if they're, if they're not open to those those changes, it can feel like it's going wrong and it's getting away from you. I think you just have to be mindful going in that making any film is, is a malleable process and it will it will change as you go through it. And um, as long as you're mindful of that going in, you will be a lot less stressed <laughs> when, when things start <laughs> to go wrong because things always go wrong. You need to just roll with it and adapt. So, yeah, best advice is when you make one film, you make three films and never forget it. Brilliant. I think that's one of the most wonderful pieces of advice I've ever heard. I've never heard that. And obviously, I'm not a filmmaker. Why would I have heard that? <laughs> I wish I knew. Right? I've read it somewhere. Oh, I, can't, I don't remember. Someone told me I read it. But I can't you know remember. what? Someone might remember. tell us. Someone might write in and tell us. It might they be might a thing. Do. And I hope so. And I'll give them all the credit in the world because it's words to live by. Oh, it's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant advice. And so my last question, a kind of obvious one, but we, we've already covered it in a way, but we're going to still do it. Why not? What's next for Mark Brennan? Let's talk about Squall, shall we? Well, next would have been a film festival circuit, which is now right. currently on something of a hiatus until the world gets back on its feet again. But um, I'm quite, I guess, fortunate in a way that a lot of the festivals I've submitted to won't happen until at least September. So hopefully, fingers crossed, one the world will be a much safer place by then and these events can continue and also some of these festivals will actually pick squall <laughs> which would be good and then i can go to it <laughs> I'm so sure that, they that's, will. Um, that's something that i'm hoping for for that in the future um another thing we're doing is we were very fortunate that we were able to have a, a london screening of the film right before everything lockdown. went mad and, and everything was locked down but it meant we weren't able to have a basingstoke screening because the film was all entirely shot in Basingstoke and we had a, a screen here we were going to have a big premiere app for everybody in the town to come out and see it um, and we, we weren't able to so instead we held a, a private kind of viewing party online for people to see it because um, you're not really meant to put your 
a film online available to the public before it's done its festival run because lots of festivals won't choose films that are already available online for people to is watch. Right? So what tends to ha- yeah, so what tends to happen is you keep it off the internet until it's finished its run, which usually can take 12 to 18 months, and then you will put the film online for everybody to see. So we are putting online for people to watch, but it's part of sort of a, a, an invite group, so it's not actually public, even though it is online, if that makes sense. Well, having seen the film, I'm sure everyone that was a member of that group really enjoyed it when this comes out. <laughs> yeah, everyone everyone's who has seen it so far has been has been very kind. I'm very lucky. No, it's, it's a real accomplishment and a great piece of work, Mark. I think that it's, uh, you know, hopefully it's, it's not going to be six years before your next film, hopefully. Oh, no, no, I've got, I've got the bug back now. After five yeah. years of not being on a set doing these things, I, I, I can't wait to, to do it again. In fact, what I'd really love to do is direct something I haven't written would be nice. Is that right? Just to try see what that would be like. I'd love to do something I haven't written because I have only written stuff, but I've never only directed stuff. So that's my next thing to try. Amazing. Amazing. See what you do with someone else's writing. That'd be really cool. Exactly. Yeah. And then, then we'll, that'll be real like, like shit, I'll get off the pot. Like either I can direct or I can't. It's one thing directing your own stuff because you know it inside out. But uh, yeah, I'd love to try directing someone else's. That's fantastic, Mark. Where can people find information about attending the Exit 6 Film Festival? All information about the festival can be found at exit6filmfestival.com. There we go. On top of the, the festival being every September and screening around, usually around 40 short films from around the world. And we have industry panels and we have a big after party and we really celebrate the filmmakers when, when they come down. We love indie filmmaking in, in general. So every week we will post, every Thursday it is, we post blog content that's buying for independent filmmakers that covers every aspect of film production. So we've had articles with the guys that catered Ridley Scott's Robin Hood. You know, what's it like feeding 2,000 Norman soldiers? On the beach? <laughs> we've, we've interviewed a, a company called Snow Business that created the, um, among other things, on the planet Crate in Last Jedi that all looks made of salt. They did all that. They've done Band of Brothers where they made a village. Like it was totally covered in snow and it wasn't. It was all fake. Oh, wow. We speak to lots of high profile filmmakers and actors such as Bern Gorman and James Callis and uh, God, so many. My head's my head's just gone. That's all right. Don't worry. But but, but so many. And uh, and that's every Thursday. So and there's lots of advice in there for filmmakers on, on every kind of aspect of, of making anything. And then it's also it's shining a light on people who are doing great, exciting things now who are coming up through the ranks. And then there's also lots of advice from experienced professionals who have been doing it for a long time. So any indie filmmaker. Uh, uh, who just or just anyone who just loves filmmaking, I would highly recommend checking out the blog each week. Wonderful. Mark Brennan, thank you so much for being the first guest back on The Note Show. It's really wonderful. Thank you for having me. I very much enjoyed it. Sorry if I waffled, but I do like a waffle. No, you're a wonderful waffler. Who doesn't love your wonderful <laughs> waffles? You are very kind. Thank you. You certainly didn't waffle at any point. You uh, gave a lot of good advice, and I, and I thought it was just fantastic. And loads of filmmakers will be listening to this and hopefully will attend the Exit 6 Film Festival. Like Mark said, you can check it out x 6 filmfestivalcom check the blog out check out squall when you can when it's available which is well when is it available mark it's going to be uh, that really haven't the we? next time it's it's hopefully picked for a film festival it'll be screening then we'll right. keep you posted where keeps posted and we will share it on social mark thank you so much thank you for having me This has been The Note Show with Joshua Note. Head on over to www.thenoteshow.com to discover more. Send us your questions, share the show with a friend, and tune in every Wednesday for another episode. Until next time.